Let's see if this works. Okay, all right. So let me start with a cryptic question here. So if a server listens in a forest and there was no one there to start it, does it really exist? Let the audience ponder that for a minute while I'll continue the rest of my talk. Okay, so um, in 2008, uh, Desire started with this following vision statement, right? And this really resonated with me. When I saw this, I said, hey, you know, this is exactly what the field needs, right? And so um, I have the honor of kicking off this edition of Desires with the first technical talk. And so I want to do my best to support the development of this conference and have it succeed. And this is a primary reason why I am talking to you live from Waterloo, Canada at 3.30 in the morning here. Um, and so, okay, what is my talk really about? Well, uh, for the first edition, I had the privilege of giving the keynote. And this was a slide from my keynote. Uh, the title was, Computing Without Servers, V8, Rocket Ships, and Other Batshit Crazy Idea in Data Systems. And as you can see, the date is August 29, 2018. And just to prove that it existed, uh, here's a picture of me giving the talk. And as you notice, I'm actually wearing the same t-shirt I planned on on purpose. Okay, so what is my talk about uh, in a roundabout way? Well, it's actually um, in that talk of uh, three years ago, I presented some half-baked ideas that I thought was cool. And so now a few years later, I basically want to come back and say, hey, we've done it. Well, what did we do? Well, we implemented some of the ideas that I had exactly talked about three years earlier. So this is serverless BM25 search and BERT re-ranking. That's a nice description of what we've actually done. Okay, all right, so let me uh, walk you through a little bit of uh, what we've actually, what it actually means. Okay, so let's start and talk about servers, right? So servers form the most fundamental building block of IR systems. And I mean that both in the sense of hardware, the physical machines, and the software, the services that run on them that cooperate to offer some capability, right? All right, so in the beginning, these were what servers look like in the context of IR, right? So I uh, stole these images from Dean's Wisdom Keynote 10 years ago. So this is what Google looked like in 1997. Uh, here's what it looked like in 1999 and uh, a few years later and sometime later also, all right. Um, okay, so servers. Uh, now I think we're a little bit more advanced fast forwarding. We have uh, servers now in the cloud. Um, and so they look much cooler now instead of usually being physical instances. Now we're really talking about virtual instances, uh, uh, containers in the cloud, all right? So they look much cooler even with mood lighting and uh, that's what they look like now on the inside and on the outside. Okay, and in terms of the software infrastructure that runs them, I think the community has sort of converged on a formula that works fairly well. So uh, most large scale IR systems work in a uh, partition replicated infrastructure. So you take a large document collection, you partition it into multiple index shards. The index shards are replicated in order to uh, provide a uh, redundancy and to increase throughput. All right, so this is once again taken from Jeff Dean's uh, wisdom keynote in 2009. All right. Well, however, despite the sort of you know nice setup and sort of maturity of these technologies, there's still lots of challenges that remain. And I'm going to focus on the case if you're not Google or Bing or Baidu or any of the large internet search companies, right? So let's say you're a small internet startup or, hey, even a research group, right? So um, let me walk through some of the pain points. Okay, so by the nurture of the server-based setup, you always have to have servers on and you always have to have services that are long running waiting on and listening on an HTTP port somewhere, waiting to service requests, 
right? So if servers are always on, if services are always on, you're always going to be incurring management overhead, right? You basically have a promise to uh, maintain the server forever, right? For uh, as long as you want to provide the service. There's the issue of scalability, right? So you design this, uh, this system to serve some load, you get more load. Okay, so what do you need to do? You need to start more servers to uh, replicate the service to uh, scale out. Um, okay, so you then need to do that automatically. And then when the load is transient, when the load goes away, you need to scale back down, destroy these instances. So you need some mechanism to scale up and scale down. Um, well, and sometimes uh, it would be nice if you could scale all the way to zero. And by that, I mean, if you have zero queries, can you not pay anything as a result of it? Right? Because of the first point, you really can't today because you always have to something have a service that's always on listening to fulfill requests. All right. Okay. So that's sort of the pain point, and that's sort of the pain point that we're trying to address. Let me talk a little bit about servers, uh, serverless, uh, and offer some preliminaries. All right. So if you look at cloud computing, the really cool thing is that it allows us to explore different abstractions and organizations of computing. And if you look at sort of high level trends, there's an increasing trend towards the disaggregation of, com of computing capabilities. So let me explain what I mean. All right. So in the beginning, there was infrastructure as a service, right? So how did that go? Well, you had the physical machines and then you had a hypervisor on top, right? And this was provided by the cloud provider. And on top of that, you ran your VM. On top of your VM, you ran your operating system. And on top of that, you ran your uh, actual application, right? So in all these diagrams for the next few slides, Blue is what you bring to the table, and tan uh, is what the cloud provider provides for you. All right. Okay. So um, if you have multi tenancy, well, so the hypervisor just runs multiple VMs that runs um, operating system and an app stack on top. Right. So this is how it worked, um, you know, ten years ago, the beginning of the cloud era. Right. Okay, so uh, sometime later, we realized that containers were a better idea than VM being more lightweight, easy to manage, and a host, a host of other nice properties. And so we evolved into a model that looks like this. You have the physical machine, you have the OS. On top of that, you had the container engine. And instead of bringing VMs, you would bring in container. Right? Inside the container, you run your app. And multi-tenancy was uh, handled in basically the same way. The container engine ran multiple containers. Right. However, in most real world applications, the stack is a little bit more complicated, right? In the container, you don't just run an app. Uh, in the context of search, you probably want to run something like OpenSearch or Elasticsearch or Solar. And then on top of that, you run your app. And if uh, in terms of real applications, they're probably going to take up more than one container. And so you want to scale out uh, onto multiple containers. So that causes a multi-container orchestration problem, right? So um, there are lots of tools to help uh, us manage multiple containers. Kubernetes is the most well-known system. But at the end of the day, it's really still a pain. Right? The tooling is getting better. It's good and it's getting better, but it's still kind of a pain. All right. So what do we do then? What's the next step of evolution? Well, if you look at sort of this thick stack now, you'll notice that from the perspective of search applications, what we really care in most cases is what lies at the top, the actual app. Right? We don't actually care that much about the uh, open search instance that's running or Elasticsearch or Solar and the containers and everything below. So can we do this? Can we just use open search as a service? Right. And, and indeed you can, right? This is exactly platform as a service concept where a platform like open search now becomes a black box that you can simply use. 
and uh, you negotiate with the cloud service provider service level agreements in terms of latency, uh, uh, capacity, scalability, et cetera. Right? But in this model, you still need to run the apps that use the platform somewhere, right? So you don't have much choice. Uh, the typical thing to do is you take your app, put it in a container, and then run it on the container engine on the OS on the physical machine. Right? But then when you scale out your app, well, you need to have multiple containers scaling out your apps. Now, the problem here is that, well, you run into exactly the multi-container orchestration problem that you've been trying to avoid in the first place. All right. Okay, so that's a nice setup to what the whole deal with serverless is. Okay. So here's how I like to explain serverless. So um, if you remember your you know, undergrad operating systems or programming languages course, wherever you learn this, sort of the operational semantics of computing, um, I stole this from Wikipedia a little while ago. So you can describe computing in terms of state and transitions. Right, states that the machine holds and transitions between those states. Now, translated into the cloud context is actually maps nicely because there are lots of cloud services that provide a state as a service. So these are persistent storage devices, databases, uh, message queues, things like that. And there's also a new breed of offerings called functions as a service which uh, are essentially blocks of code that you provide with well-defined entry and exit points. Okay, so this is how it works, computing without servers. So you have this big black box, state as a service offering, a persistent storage databases, message queues, things like that. And over on the right-hand side, you have a function as a service offering, right? And your role as a developer your role is to write a bunch of functions, right? And typically these functions read state from the state as a service offering, perform some type of computation and then update the state, right? So, so it's a read, modify, compute, update cycle, right? And the cloud provider handles everything else. Right. Everything else includes everything from resource allocation, scaling up and down, uh, load balancing, cleaning up, et cetera. Uh, of course, the functions have to run somewhere, right? Um, they're in actuality running on containers somewhere, but the cloud provider handles the execution uh, and the life cycle of those containers. All right. And the cost model is you pay per functional invocation, right? All you're paying for is the function running for some period of time. So in this work, we work with uh, uh, AWS. And in particular, we use a, a, a AWS Lambda, which is their, the name of their function as a service offering. But all the major cloud providers provide similar ideas. Uh, Google, uh, Azure, et cetera, they all provide something along the same lines. Okay. Now, this is actually already relatively established. Um, they're just, uh, I'll just provide a couple of examples. So these are examples that Amazon provides. So for example, you want to have a thumbnail generation process. All right, so you take a picture, the picture gets uploaded into S3 bucket, a Lambda is triggered that takes the image, generates thumbnails, for example, and put it somewhere else. Um, Amazon also describes a uh, TL process. So you have, um, records that get inserted into Dynamo BDB as an operational database. Every once in a while, a Lambda is triggered that takes uh, the uh, operational data, rolls it up, performs some transformations, and dumps it into data warehouse uh, that then serves the industry processes. And you could actually build relatively complex applications with just uh, AWS Lambda and a bunch of different state as a service offerings. Uh, persistent storage, database, queues, things along those lines. All right. So serverless computing isn't actually computing without servers. Right? It's just that the servers become someone else's problems. All right. So I think that's a 
answer to this question, the cryptic question I started off with, why if a server listens in a forest and there was no one there to start it, does it really exist? Okay, so um, what would a serverless search engine look like, right? So before we've been talking about service applications in the abstract, now let's talk about IR. Okay, so um, we actually already have an answer. So Matt Crane and I uh, wrote a short paper in ICTR 2017 that proposed a prototype of serverless search. And so as you would expect, what we did is we took query evaluation uh, algorithm and stuck it in AWS Lambda function as a service. Next question is, well, you know, you, you need postings, right? For, uh, for traverse, uh, you, the query evaluation algorithm needs to traverse postings. You got to put the posting somewhere, right? Back then, our idea was to stick it in DynamoDB. So this is Amazon's key value store. And so what the AWS Lambda function query evaluator would do is to issue requests to DynamoDB, fetch the postings corresponding to the terms, and then traverse the postings to traverse the postings to compute the, the rank list. All right. And this would be in response to a client that issues a search request via uh, some API gateway, right? Client issues a request. API gateway forwards it to the query evaluation lambda, and then the, the, the rest of what I just described happens. Right, so the result gets returned to the client. Right? And so the nice thing about this setup is that as a client increases the rate of requests, different query evaluation instances get fired up. And as more clients join the, the, the request pool, um, the lambdas just scale out automatically, courtesy of the cloud provider, Amazon in this case. And similarly, the request to DynamoDB scale out as well, All right? So in the words of the poet Jay-Z, um, I got 99 problems, but scaling ain't one. Okay, so um, how well did this work? Well, the truth is, not really, it didn't work very well as we described a few years ago. So here's some results, latency results. Um, and we did some ablation analyses, but the, I, the, but, the, but the bottom line is that it took too long. This architecture required something like 3.1 seconds to retrieve a query standard Trek query from the Gov2 collection. There was just a lot of overhead at the Lambda end, at the processing end, at the query end, waiting for the fetches for DynamoDB to sort of make it work and make it practical. Okay, so fast forward a few years later, uh, this is take two, and I think we got it to work a lot better. And let me describe what we did. Okay, so the technical highlights is that we have now built serverless Lucene, right? So before it was essentially a custom code base that, uh, you know, did its custom query evaluation, right? Uh, but this time around, we just took Lucene library off the shelf, basically, and made it work in a serverless environment. Right. So the index structures in our new iteration are stored on S3, and the query evaluation is, uh, is still happens in AWS Lambda. And we are able to do this with minimal modifications to vanilla Lucene by, I think, cleverly taking advantage of, it, of its abstractions. So Lucene has reasonable abstractions for reading from stream of bytes, and what we did is re-implement those abstractions so such that it now reads from the cloud environment in the uh, Lambda environment. So reading from S3 specifically in this case. All right, so uh, what about query latency? Well, in terms of query latency, there are two instances to consider. The first is the cold startup instance. Um, and we get, that, get around that by loading the indexes in memory. 
And then there is the warm execution instance when a container is already warmed up. In this case, the indexes are already in memory. And so we don't have um, uh, any latency issues uh, associated with that. It's just, just like any other standard in memory search, right? You start up a server, you load the indexes in memory, and from there you're serving, right? Except this all happens in a, uh, in a AWS Lambda environment. Okay, so it looks something like this. Uh, you have a search crime from the web browser, issues a, a request to the API gateway. The API gateway calls uh, something we call a fetch lambda. The fetch lambda calls a search lambda that actually does the searching uh, over Lucene indexes stored on S3. The results get returned back to the fetch lambda. Now you know why it's called a fetch lambda. The fetch lambda then goes and actually fetches the raw documents from DynamoDB and returns it to the, uh, the results to the, to the client. Okay. But serverless Lucene isn't enough, right? Because these days people want to implement some type of retrieve and re-rank architecture, right? So you wanna start off with a pile of documents, select some promising text, re-rank the selected text before you get the answer. Right. Um, so this part I've already talked about with Lucene. Uh, but these days, people want to use Bird and Transformers for the re-ranking role. Right. Something like the Bonobird model, uh, which is in essence a cross encoder re-ranker. Right. So here we can do serverless. I've already explained that. Uh, what about here? Right. So the question is, well, can we do serverless Bird? Right. And as a matter of fact, we can. You know, it's a good thing that it's embarrassingly parallel, and so it, was, it wasn't that bad, uh, that hard to, uh, to implement. So I'll walk you through the technical highlights. As you would expect, we perform serverless BERT inference using AWS Lambda. And instead of using BERT, we actually take advantage of a variant of BERT that uses uh, early exit optimizations in order to reduce inference latency. And the main technical challenge here was the model size, right? And this is uh, the models get pretty big and you gotta put the container images somewhere. And as it turns out, this is solved by the uh, Elastic Container Registry service that AWS provides. And so uh, glossing over many technical details that my students spend many sleepless nights uh, implementing, it's what we call a SMOP, a small matter of programming, just to get everything uh, wired up, right? So the bad is, at least for Lambda, we're stuck with CPU inference. The good is that because of Lambda, we get massive parallelism. I'll come back to that in a bit. And the ugly is that image packaging, getting the entire stack and the, uh, the image of the model all wired up together, it was a huge pain, all right? So put all together, it looks something like this. Via the API gateway, uh, it triggers a search lambda. The search lambda pulls a container that has the re-ranking model uh, from the Elastic Container Registry and does the scoring and the re-ranking. All right, so let me present some results. Uh, those, so the setup is we're using MS Marco. So this is an MS Marco passage ranking corpus and task. The setup is we're re-ranking a thousand hits from Lucene with the Monobert cross encoder model. Okay, so here are the results from the table. Um, we verify that the effectiveness is, is the same as uh, between a serverless deployment and a server-based de deployment. For reference, we have a server-based deployment running on a system with a V100 GPU. So the key number that you want to focus on is this. So this is the end-to-end -end latency of 12 seconds, and this is the cost of per query. And the cost is $16 US dollars per 100 query. And here is a reference condition for a server-based implementation um, uh, on a server with V100. Okay, so right off the bat, your question must be like, whoa, wait a second. How can the CPU be faster than the GPU? Okay, well, first of all, 
things are relatively slow because we're ranking a thousand hits, right? But we can always decrease that. The reason why we're able to have the CPU beat the GPU in this case is massive parallelism. So what we're doing in this implementation actually is in the re-ranking, we're firing off a hundred parallel instances that each re-rank 10 uh, documents on the, on the CPU. So uh, that's why it's able to actually have lower latency by taking advantage of massive parallelism. And in fact, this is exactly the point of Lambda is that Amazon handles the scaling out behind the scenes. Okay, so the next thing you notice is, yeah, it's, it's, it's expensive, right? It's seven to eight times more expensive than the server-based version on uh, running on V100. Um, so uh, what this means is that if your server is idle 85 to 90% of the time, then this is, uh, this is the point at which the server-based uh, serverless model becomes cheaper. Okay, so you must have a number of objections. I can't see the audience, but I can, I can know, I can feel the questions that you're asking, right? It's still too slow, right? 12 seconds end to end, that's kind of ridiculous, right? And it's still too expensive based on the cost breakdown I just provided to you, right? Um, so, I mean, I agree, right? I agree. Uh, but I think my response is, you know, this is only the beginning, right? Serverless infrastructure over time will become more efficient. And there are lots of other neural inference acceleration techniques that we want to try, right? So in both respects, we can essentially ride the wave of future improvements essentially for free, All right? Um, and with this serverless architecture, we have minimal management overhead and essentially infinite scaling. And so perhaps these costs are the price you have to pay. Right. And so I hope I've convinced you that altogether serverless search is still a infrastructure type of infrastructure design and architecture that's worth considering. All right, that's all I have. I'd be happy to take any questions and let's see how a in person remote discussion will now work. Uh, so the good news is Jimmy answered a lot of questions in his slides because according to the clock. The clock, we have very little time. Uh, let me just ask one question as the chair. That's the easier thing in, in whatever mode hybrid. Uh, you said this, all this timing is with the Lucene index waiting for you in memory, and that is free of charge or? Oh, sorry. So all your time timing is with the Lucene index waiting in memory for you uh, available yes. upon request, right? Uh, so, okay, yes, so I glossed over this, um, and so let me explain, take the opportunity to explain a little more detail on how Amazon uh, or a cloud provider manages uh, things behind the scene. So if your Lambda has not been running for a while, then it is essentially in a cold state. So behind the scenes, uh, Amazon evicts it from, from the container engine that's running, right? So the first time when you call your Lambda, um, it gets brought into a memory and brought into the container engine and warmed up, right? And then subsequent calls then uh, basically become just something that is already running on the container engine. And so it's, it's, it's just serving a request, okay? Now, the beauty of this is that uh, Amazon handles all the orchestration of firing up the container, warming up the instance behind the scenes, and you're only paying for the computation time that's actually being used, right? So the first instance, you're probably paying a slightly longer cost because you have to load your indexes in memory, et cetera. Uh, but the, but for the subsequent time, it's a very fast execution, right? Because everything's already in memory and you're just paying for, you know, uh, you know a couple hundred milliseconds for the query evaluation uh, to happen. Now, before uh, the, uh, 
this is what happens while it's warm and there are queries being issued. Now, of course, if queries stop, you know, Amazon's gonna say, well, you know, uh, your, your function isn't running, we can't make money off of you. So it's gonna evict it from the sort of the live container that's running. And then, you'll go, then you're gonna go back in a cold state. Yeah, it's very clear. So uh, do we have a short question? Hopefully a short answer. I see somebody here in the physical audience. You have a question for our audience and for Michael. Yeah, so I can imagine this works really well, uh, Jimmy, for uh, doing uh, experiments as IR researchers, where you get your queries in batches of 100. Mm -hmm. But if you want to run a service online, don't you then always pay the call to what transition for every query? If you don't have a lot of queries. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, so, so thanks for the question, Arian. Yes. Um, Exactly, and I, I think I think you're, I agree with everything you said. Um, and you know, being a research group, this is the, exactly the scenario I, I had in mind. So, a research group that issue queries and batches is sort of one uh, sweet spot in which this works very well. Another actually is something that works uh, driven by uh, an ingestion pipeline. So that's say some query service was part of an ingestion pipeline that's actually very bursty. I think this type of design will actually work very well as well. Okay, but at the end of the day, it is really all about utilization, right? So if you have servers and they are fully utilized, then nothing that you do, no other architecture is going to be uh, is, is going to be more uh, cost effective, right? So it's all about utilization. And so based on the current breakdown, our break-even point in which it's uh, cheaper is at 85 and 90 percent idle. So it means that you're not you're not serving that many queries. But as the technology improves, as we bring the cost down, as things become more efficient, I would sort of expect this break-even point to become more and more in favor of, uh, uh, of the advantage of serverless technologies. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, it does. 